Hi, everyone, and welcome to Civil Litigation for Survivors of Employee on Student Sexual Violence. My name is Laura Cook. I'm a staff attorney with the National Center for Victims of Crime. Uh, this webinar series has been made possible by the generous support of the National Association of Attorneys General Training and Research Institute. So we thank them for their support. Today, our presenter is Monica Beck. Uh, she is a civil litigator who has over a decade of experience representing individuals and businesses in complex state and federal litigation. Prior to joining the Fearberg National Law Group, Monica practiced for nine years at the U.S. headquarters of Skadden, one of the largest private law firms. Afterwards, she served as Deputy General Counsel at Phoenix South Foundation Incorporated, the nation's largest nonprofit organization dedicated to substance abuse treatment and prevention. She also served as Special Assistant Corporation Counsel with the New York City Law Department and represented the city in connection with personal injury claims. Monica earned a bachelor's degree in economics from Northwestern University and graduated cum laude, cum laude from the University of Michigan Law School, where she served as an associate editor on the Michigan Journal of Law Reform. And she is admitted to practice in state and federal courts in New York and Michigan. So with that quick bio, I will turn it over to Monica for our webinar. Well, thank you so much, Laura. I am honored and thrilled to be um, presenting this webinar today. Um, and as Laura said, this webinar is about representing survivors of employee on student sexual violence in civil litigation, and specifically in the K through 12 setting. Um, and I'm also going to talk about some of the key issues that arise in this type of litigation and using some um, examples from a case that my law firm and I am currently working on, which is King v. Curtis. And in that lawsuit, we're representing four young women who, as high school students, were sexually assaulted by um, their high school substitute teacher, who was also a, a weight room volunteer, a softball coach volunteer um, in their high school, and who also happens to be a former professional baseball player. And uh, his name is Chad Curtis. Now, this litigation is still pending, so um, I'm going to focus a lot on um, the motion for summary judgment that we brought against um, Chad Curtis and some of the, the legal issues um, and uh, facts that um, we're going to be dealing with in our upcoming motion for summary judgment against Lakewood Schools on our Title IX and Section 1983 claims. Um, we recently won our summary judgment motion against Mr. Curtis on a tort claim for battery against him. Um, and our summary judgment motion, uh, motion against the school is actually due in mid-March. So a lot of national attention has been focused on sexual harassment and violence in schools, um, but I think that sexual violence in the K through 12 setting has some distinct characteristics that warrant special consideration. Um, first, um, the statistics of K through 12 sexual violence are arguably hard to come by. Um, we know it's estimated that approximately 70% of sexual assault cases in general are never even reported to authorities. And uh, K through 12 schools, unlike universities, are not required to report sexual violence statistics on an annual basis. And universities are required to do that by the Clery Act. Uh, nevertheless, we do know uh, some statistics, and they are, they're quite alarming. And as you can see in the PowerPoint, 48% um, of students grades 7 through 12 experience some form of sexual harassment at school, and sexual harassment does run the gamut um, from, uh, from, let's say, bullying all the way to sexual assault. Um, we know that 21% of middle school students experience unwanted physical touching, um, almost 12% and 4.5% and of girls and almost 5% of boys in high school uh, have been physically forced to have sexual intercourse and 42.2% of female rape victims are first raped before the age of 18. Also, I don't have the statistics on these slides, but when you consider the uh, statistics involving school employees or educators sexual assault of students, um, the data is just as alarming. Uh, back in 2004, Dr. Cheryl Shakeshaft prepared and researched a 2004 study for the U.S. Department of Education, and she found that approximately 10% of students have been targets of educator sexual misconduct. Um, and at that time, and this study was done about 10 years ago, and pre-sexual abuse of children was often in the headline news, Dr. Shakeshaft concluded that the physical sexual abuse of students in schools is likely more than 100 times the abuse by priests. 
Another special characteristic in the K-12 setting is the nature of the perpetrator. And um, again, we're talking about adult perpetrators in this webinar. And these are adults who, um, who you, frankly use their positions of authority to manipulate children, to groom them. Um, these predators often establish a close or trusting relationship with the child. Um, they let the child know that he or she is special. Um, they often will spend time with him or her outside of school. Often they will text them, call them, um, tell them they're different, buy them gifts. And they also will often threaten them. Um, after they've sexually abused a child, they will often threaten the child, um, threaten her ch the child or her family, um, and let them know that if they report the abuse, they'll harm them or the family. They also sometimes will uh, manipulate the child by um, telling her that if she reports, it will ruin his or her career or his or her family life. So these adult perpetrators, they establish trust, and then they completely manipulate and betray that trust with the children that they abuse. Also, when you consider the, the survivors or the victims of this type of sexual abuse, children in the K-12 through setting often don't disclose um, sexual abuse or they just delay disclosing sexual, sexual abuse because they fear, again, they fear being harmed by the perpetrator who, has, who may have threatened them, or they fear the reaction of their parents. Um, also, some of these victims are sexually naive, and sometimes because they're confused um, about the sexual abuse, they, they often don't report. Um, and that's because sometimes the sexual abuse of children is committed under the guise of a game, uh, of care or treatment, or even a, a, as a form of education. Um, another special aspect of K-12 through sexual violence is the lack of training in schools. Um, we see an astonishing lack of training in uh, reporting, recognizing, investigating, responding to complaints of sexual abuse. We also see a uh, lack of training with respect to students um, and informing them of how to report or who to report sexual abuse to. Um, there are times that we've seen in schools where Title IX coordinators don't even know what's required under Title IX or um, think that Title IX only has something to do with school athletics. Um, there's a very extreme example that is sometimes referred to as the rape bait case, and that is Hill v. Cundiff, and that's from the 11th Circuit. And in that case, a middle school student complained to a teacher that she was being propositioned by a, a male student, and school officials uh, hatched a sort of a sting operation plan to catch the male student in the act, and that actually resulted in the female student being raped. There also doesn't seem to be a lot of training in K-12 through in how to deal with the harassment and bullying that, stuff that survivors face. Um, oftentimes when a survivor does step forward, the harassment, bullying, and retaliation they suffer is, um, creates a horrible hostile envir environment for him or her. Um, and given the prevalence of social media in high schools, um, this sort of bullying and cyberbullying and harassment um, can, be, can be quite terrible. Also, we know that the consequences of sexual violence are extreme. Um, the physical consequences include everything from co chronic pain, headaches, uh, drastic weight loss, gastrointestinal issues. Um, survivors can often suffer guilt, shame, anger, depression, um, distrust, betrayal, anxiety. They often suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, um, and they can also suffer from sleep disorders, low self-esteem, avoidance and isolation behaviors, and inability to concentrate. Um, in the long term, we know that victims of childhood sexual violence often suffer interpersonal relation problems as adults, um, problems with uh, partner relationships, problems with parenting, um, and they're susceptible to substance abuse problems, employment problems, and depression as adults. Um, and starting, startingly, um, health problems associated with childhood victimization can even make survivors vulnerable to early death. Um, the consequences of sexual violence, it also affects families and parents. Um, the sexual violence uh, against children can severely in impact survivors' families, uh, have a negative impact on their parents' marriage, um, on their siblings, and especially siblings who remain in the school di district or in the school um, where a survivor was, was victimized. So now I want to turn a little bit to uh, the litigation that I mentioned um, 
the King v. Curtis litigation. Um, this is currently pending in the Federal District Court of the Western District of Michigan. Um, and some of you may have heard of Chad Curtis. Uh, he is a former Major League Baseball player. Um, he was a professional player from 1992 to 2001. And in the nine years that he played, he played for six different teams, including the California Angels, the, Ti the Detroit Tigers, the uh, Los Angeles Dodgers, Cleveland Indians, uh, the Yankees, and the Texas Rangers. After he retired from the big leagues, uh, Curtis began working at schools in southwestern Michigan. Um, he had actually attended four different colleges in Arizona in four different years, and after retiring, he earned a teaching certificate at a school that was close to Grand Rapids in Michigan. He worked at two different schools in the Grand Rapids area in a relatively short period of time. And I don't know about you, but you might be seeing a pattern here with uh, attending four different schools in four different years and working at two different schools in a pretty short period of time. Um, that's one of the red flags um, that's often raised with uh, adult sexual predators. Um, Chris became a substitute teacher and a school volunteer for uh, Lakewood Public Schools um, in February of 2010. Um, and on April 27, 2012, police arrived at Lakewood Schools. Um, one of uh, Chad Curtis's victims, who's also one of our clients and uh, a plaintiff in the civil case brought against Curtis in the Lakewood Schools, um, had gone to the police and talked about Chad Curtis's sexual abuse of her. Um, Chad Curtis was arrested um, on August 16, 2013. Following a week-long trial, uh, Curtis was found guilty of sexually assaulting um, three girls from the Lakewood High School. Um, these three girls are all our clients and plaintiffs in the civil case against Curtis. Um, he was found guilty of having engaged in criminal sexual misconduct with the girls. Um, and at his sentencing on, in October of 2013, he was sentenced to 17 to 15 years in prison. That was the maximum then allowed by the Michigan sentencing guidelines, and the judge at that time explained she would have increased the prison term, um, but she was worried about exceeding the, the guidelines and providing Curtis with the basis to appeal um, his criminal conviction. Um, what we learned through the criminal trial is that um, Curtis had basically unlimited access to students at the school. Um, he was uh, given access to all areas of the school, including the weight room and a uh, school training room. Um, that was a windowless locked room in the high school, and that is where he um, often sexually assaulted his, the, his students, often under the guise of providing them with therapeutic massage. Um, never mind that he wasn't qualified or licensed in any way to provide therapeutic massage or therapy. Um, it was revealed that Curtis um, touched the young women's bodies. Um, he often straddled them on a massage table. He touched them in all of their intimate areas, and he actually digitally, digitally penetrated uh, one of the plaintiffs. Um, the Michigan Court of Appeals subsequ subsequently affirmed Curtis's convictions, and the Michigan Supreme Court recently denied Curtis's application for leave to appeal. Um, we understand that Curtis is actually uh, considering whether he is going to request resentencing. Um, so on April 11, 2014, our clients, the plaintiffs, filed their civil complaint against Curtis and the Lakewood schools. Uh, the plaintiffs brought two tort claims against Curtis, which include battery and intentional infliction of extreme emotional distress, and they brought Section 1983 and Title IX claims against Lakewood schools. Um, I'm going to uh, actually jump a slide here, uh, a couple slides, and talk about some of the issues and, and important things to consider if you are uh, going to name an adult perpetrator as a defendant in a civil lawsuit. Um, we, as I said, we filed a motion for summary judgment against Curtis, and some very interesting issues came up along the way. Um, as we were, as, as we were uh, arguing our motion for summary judgment, um, the court actually had some questions about collateral estoppel. And so that was one of the first issues we faced. Um, now, Car Curtis had been found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt for having engaged in criminal sexual conduct with the three plaintiffs. And we argued that that, that verdict established the elements of the tort claims that the plaintiffs had asserted against him. 
So one of the issues that came up is something that's called crossover estoppel, and we had to brief this uh, for the court. Crossover estoppel is when a defendant is precluded from relitigating an issue already adjudicated in a criminal proceeding in a subsequent civil proceeding. So basically we're saying, look, it was already established that, that Curtis, you know, touched these girls in an inappropriate way. Um, the elements of, of battery in Michigan are non-consensual, inten intentional, and offensive touching of another without lawful justification. So we were able to establish that the um, the crime that Curtis, the crimes that Curtis was convicted of, also established the elements of battery. Um, it wasn't quite uh, clear whether the law in Michigan uh, 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 um, recognizes crossover estoppel, but the court agreed with our analysis and found um, that Curtis was stopped from from challenging um, the elements of, of of battery and also from asserting defenses against the plaintiff's tort claims. Um, one of those defenses uh, was consent. So in Responding to our motion for summary judgment, Curtis had argued that he was entitled to argue that the plaintiffs consented to his sexual assault of them. Um, and interesting enough, the school defendants actually joined with Curtis in making that argument, which we found somewhat astonishing, um, given that uh, a school would take that position. Um, so, and, and, and the issue that arose was it wasn't clear whether, although consent isn't a defense, to criminal sexual conduct with, minor, to, with a minor, to, to an adult's criminal sexual conduct with a minor. Uh, no Michigan court had ever actually stated that uh, defense, or I'm sorry, that, con that consent um, is also not a defense to a civil case based on uh, an underlying act involving criminal sexual conduct with a minor. Um, so we made the argument that um, Michigan statutes carve out special protection for children from sexual assault by adults. Uh, Michigan statutes provide different penalties um, for uh, children sexual assault by adults um, that vary in accordance with the age of the victim, the age difference between the victim and the perpetrator, and the perpetrator's position of authority over um, the victim. We also found several civil cases in Michigan involving indemnification under insurance policies. And these were civil cases um, where a plaintiff pled tort claims uh, based on criminal sexual conduct between an adult perpetrator and a minor. Um, and the courts in those cases um, found that the intent to injure or harm is inferred as a matter of law when an adult engages in criminal, criminal sexual misconduct with a minor. Um, I don't know, in, in your state, the states are all actually different with respect to the ability of a defendant to use consent as a defense in a civil case. Um, in these circumstances where the underlying conduct is sexual misconduct. Um, there are some really great state cases out there that discuss in detail uh, public policy and rationale behind protecting children from sexual abuse in both the criminal and the civil arenas, um, especially where schools are concerned. And the court did adopt our position um, in the report and recommendation that the magistrate judge issued. Um, she did adopt our position. We wish that she had gone into a little bit more analysis regarding the issue. Um, and we're very happy in that the district court, judge, district court judge, Judge Neff, adopted the magistrate judge's report and recommendation. Um, with respect to our claims against Lakewood schools, as I said, um, we're in the process of drafting our motion for summary judgment, so I don't want to go into too much detail um, about, um, <laughs> about our upcoming arguments. Um, but obviously, we have, a, we have a Title IX claim against the school. Um, um, and on the slide, you can see um, that you know Title IX prohibits sexual discrimination in schools, and sexual discrimination includes sexual violence. Um, the elements that we're going to have to prove are that the school district had actual knowledge of sexual harassment, um, and those elements are established in Davis v. Monroe County Board of Education, 526 U.S. 629. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court in Gebster also held that um, the, uh, it must be actually known by an official of the school district who has authority to institute corrective measures on the district's behalf. So if a principal or some other um, person with authority in the school who has, uh, who has the authority to impose discipline has actual knowledge of the sexual harassment, um, then you've established uh, one of the elements um, required under Title IX. 
Um, the second element is that the school district is deliberately indifferent to sexual harassment. Um, and deliberate indifference occurs when a school's response to sexual harassment is clearly unreasonable in light of the known circumstances. Um, and we, that standard is set forth in Vance v. Spencer County Public School District in the Sixth Circuit. Um, there's also another case in the Sixth Circuit that's pretty great. It's the Patterson v. Hudson Air Schools. Um, and in that case, the Sixth Circuit ruled that um, if a school district has knowledge, its actions are inadequate and effective. Um, it's required to take reasonable action in light of those circumstances to eliminate the behavior. So in other words, if a school district knows its efforts to eliminate uh, harassment are ineffective, it cannot continue to use the same methods without avail. Um, and that can establish deliberate indifference. Um, and then we have the third element of, uh, of a Title IX claim, which is sexual harassment that's severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive, um, and, and so that it could be said to, to deprive a plaintiff of educational opportunities or benefits provided by a school. And we have, there's case law that establishes one, instant, one incident of sexual violence is enough, and um, this can be shown through things like lower grades or the uh, psychological impact of sexual harassment. Um, we have learned uh, through discovery, which actually closes on Monday, um, some some pretty again some pretty interesting facts that you know we think that show deliberate indifference and also by the way violation of Section 1983 um, at almost every level in the school. Um, we know that Lakewood High School administrators um, actually. Um, walked in on defendant Curtis, uh, or on Chad Curtis, uh, when he was alone in the school training room with two of the plaintiffs. Um, the principal walked in on Curtis alone in the school training room um, before Curtis engaged in criminal sexual misconduct um, with the rest of the plaintiffs. Um, the assistant principal um, also walked in on, on Curtis alone in the training room with uh, one of the plaintiffs when he did sexually assault her. Um, the assistant principal received a complaint from another student uh, who isn't a plaintiff in this case um, who complained that Curtis had made her feel trapped in the school weight room and she felt uncomfortable with him. And he didn't do anything to investigate it. He simply talked to Curtis and, and told him to not talk to the student. Um, we also know, and this is pretty remarkable, um, Shortly after the police arrived at the Lakewood School, um, less than a week later, Curtis admitted to a school board member that he had kissed uh, one of the plaintiffs on school grounds and had feelings for her. And um, this was prior to Curtis's arrest. Now, the school board member actually sat on that information. He had a very close personal relationship with Curtis, and he didn't tell anybody. He didn't tell anybody on the school board. He didn't tell the police. And it was actually um, when I was deposing him <laughs> um, that, that um, he came forward with this information. Apparently, he had told his wife and a very close friend, but that's all. Um, and we all, we, the, um, the prosecutor um, um, who prosecuted Curtis during his criminal trial uh, was very interested in this information. And we understand that uh, he's looking into whether um, some kind of whether the school board member may have violated some kind of obligation, especially with respect to reporting to Child Protective Services. Um, we have two school, the school, school, board, school board member and another school board member who supported Curtis. Um, they both submitted character reference letters for Curtis during his criminal proceedings. And again, this was a school board member who knew that Curtis had kissed and had feelings for one of the plaintiffs. Um, The plaintiffs in this case suffered severe harassment after they did come forward. Um, and to this day, actually, they continue to suffer um, bullying and harassment. Um, we know that there were um, approximately 28 contacts that the students or our plaintiffs and their parents made with school administration. Um, not a single student was seriously disciplined for harassment or bullying for over two years. Um, the, uh, Girls were told things like they were being overly sensitive or that um, you should really like put yourself in um, their harasser's shoes. 
um, administrators told the plaintiffs when they reported this, this bullying that, you know, we just can't make them like you. Um, and we do see this in a lot of different cases now. We ha I have another case in, in Michigan where our plaintiff was told some similar things by school administration. Um, and in this case, the assistant principal even told one of our clients that she was simply paranoid. Um, So we think that going forward, and again, I don't want to talk too much about our strategy um, or you know what our particular arguments will be, but if you kind of think about these facts and, and the applicable case law, um, I'm really hoping that um, sometime later this spring, hopefully or in the summer, um, there might be another webinar in which we um, report some, some really good results. We do have a very favorable case in the Western District. It's Dovey Forest Hills. It's on the slide, um, and in that case, um, is the then chief judge of the district court issued an opinion in which he found that the school system's failure to train administrators or staff in, on Title IX um, constituted a violation of Section 1983. Um, so we're really happy about that case. Um, we hope that King B. Curtis um, joins the, the body of, of uh, Title IX case law um, that helps um, protect victims and achieve justice. Um, for survivors of sexual abuse. And lastly, um, I just want to talk about what a rewarding um, field this is. Um, as Laura said, I practiced law at uh, Skadden um, for a number of years, and that was very satisfying. But it's also especially satisfying to represent um, victims, uh, survivors. Um, to help achieve justice for them, and it's a very uh, it's an area of law that's very complex. It's evolving, and uh, is a really unique legal opportunity. So thank you. Thank you so much, Monica, for that great presentation, for taking the time uh, to talk to us today about all these important issues. Uh, if anybody has any questions. Please feel free to type them into the Q&A box below. I don't see anything yet, but if there are questions, I would be happy to ask them. Uh, in the meantime, I'll let everybody know the next webinar is going to be held on March 1st at 2 o'clock. It is entitled Accommodations for Survivors of Campus Sexual Assault. And it is also a free webinar and will be presented by Carrie Simon. Again, that's March 1st at 2 o'clock Eastern Time. Um, and you can register at the National Crime Victim, National Center for Victims of Crime website, uh, victimsofcrime.org slash training. Okay, and so if, if there are no questions, um, we'll close it there. And I do believe that, let's see, Monica's email, is Monica, is your email available uh, in oh, case people okay. have questions? Um, yeah, it might be on the last slide here. Um, oh, that's our, that's just our website. But no, my, um, my email address is mbeck at tfnlgroup.com. Okay, you can also great. find my contact information on our firm website. Okay, that's great. So then if we, if anybody has questions, um, I appreciate you, Monica, being able to answer them after the fact. Absolutely. Uh, one of the attendees did ask if they could be sent legal sites for the cases that were mentioned. Of course. Of course, if well, you just send, national... actually just send me an email. If you send me an email, I can definitely send you the sites to the cases. And if it would be easier, we can also, the National Center always sends up follow-up emails. Um, we can send out any additional information like your email address and case citations in that follow-up. Okay, that sounds great. Okay, again, thank you, Monica. We really appreciate you being here to talk to us about this. Um, thank you all attendees for listening. Um, have a good day, and we hope to see you at the next webinar. Thanks very much.